Uh, Des, how you doing? I'm good, Gary. Yourself? Good, mate. I'm good. Um, we're just chatting there, obviously, and we'll go through it as as we go. But you've done you've done a few good things in your kind of working <laughs> career, shall we say? Aye, I've had a I've had a varied a varied life from football to uh, sales to owning businesses to charity work to uh, listen. No, I've always kind of maintained that. Um, whatever you enjoy doing you should mm. do it and I'm, I'm very fortunate that yeah. i've had the opportunity to participate in a lot of things that i actually enjoy doing i've never mm. really considered that i've had to go to work because i love doing what i'm doing that yeah. sounds a bit corny but i actually love doing what i'm doing i love meeting people and i love trying to solve their problems and yeah. take the pain out of their situations that yeah. whatever they might be involved in so I yeah, a, ver a varied uh, old life that I would never <laughs> have been able to have predicted when I was a, a school kid in Kirk and Tiller, you know what did you want to do when you were at school what was the football was that the dream S something Aye. was that one wanted to be a footballer Aye. lived every second every day dreaming about being a footballer mm -hmm. um, didn't quite get to the levels that my dreams had kind of prepared me for but uh, very content with mm -hmm. what I did achieve because it was um, down to my attitude more than anything else yeah. I, I, everything else played second for and I mean everything else ask yeah. my wife everything else <laughs> played, played second for adult football just and a priority that was it and I'm very fortunate that my wife supported me through that period of my, my life where mm -hmm. my children were young and I was travelling up and down to Queen of the South two mm -hmm. or three times a week in Dumfries but no just what all I wanted to be was a footballer mm -hmm. and did you you came through Celtic youth I was system not, no I, I was actually I, I bounced around a couple of different youth teams in Glasgow so West Park mm -hmm. Boys Club out in uh, Bishop Briggs right. was the kind of first uh, real boys club played for Milton Juniors and Milton Camp originally Milton Campsy mm -hmm. north side of the city um, played for Milton Boys Club out there then when I went to secondary school I was scouted by a guy called Mike Riley right. who was in charge of West Park at that time and I went and played for West Park uh, Boys Club big boys club now or a big sorry football club obviously mm -hmm. the girls teams now as well yeah. of course uh, but back then it was just a boys club I then went to Postle YM uh, and then Easter Craig's two clubs that were uh, kind of synonymous with producing yeah. very talented young footballers yeah. and guys like me uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Celtic signed me from Easter Craig's mm -hmm. uh, I was in my second year at under 18 level and I uh, was offered a contract at Celtic. Right. I was offered to go full time, but I just started Jordan Hill College, where right. I had uh, I'd actually thought about when I, I wasn't offered any footballing mm -hmm. contracts at the age of sixteen. Yeah, I did fairly well at school. I was, mm -hmm. I was quite academic, even though I did kind of spend all my time playing football. <laughs> um, but. I was I was offered a full time contract, but I'd literally just started at Jordan Hill College. I made a decision, and Billy McNeil, who was a manager at Celtic at the time, uh, I can and he, he then did the forward of my book right. that I had published back in two thousand. And Billy said that he can always remember the fact that you know I was I was willing to put my eggs in that basket rather than just going all in with football. And he kind of respected me for yeah. it, but it was a strange thing to do given that. All I dreamt about was to uh -huh. be a footballer, you know, but I just thought, try and get your ex education first yeah. and you can then go to the football. Mm -hmm. Didn't quite work out that way. It's such a rarity as well because you probably, if you were to ask 100 kids in that position, probably a 99 of them are taking the contract and, yeah. and going with it. Did you ever regret it at any point or did you ever think I might have made the wrong decision? No, never. No. I, I, I think throughout my f football life, I've never got my ambitions mixed up, mixed up with my abilities. Right. <laughs> and I think even way back then, uh, it, there were, oh, listen, what, what were the chances of me coming through and playing yeah, Celtic yeah. on a weekly basis or mm -hmm. even to play once with them in mean, Berlin yeah. the first time I didn't, played in the reserves a number of times, yeah, well, fairly consistently during the course of that season. But mm -hmm. I never, ever regretted it because the way that my, my life kind of panned out and my mm -hmm. football life panned out, I really did get the best of both worlds yeah. because I didn't come to a shuddering halt at the age yeah. of 33, 34 and then have to think, what do I do now? Yeah. Because 
the differential between the working man working man's wage back then or mm-hmm. working person's wage back then and the kind of Premier League footballer wasn't anything like what it is now. Yeah. What it is now. Yeah. So the guys in that team, and funnily enough, I, I, I would still bump into some of the guys in the first team who wouldn't know me from being at Celtic. They would mm-hmm. just know me from maybe working in the media for a period yeah. of time and stuff. Um, I was golfing with Charlie Nicholas a couple of weeks ago. I see Pat Bonner fairly regularly, mm-hmm. Martin McLeod. These guys were getting paid good money. Yeah. But it wasn't the money that they could just stop working. Yeah, yeah like current climate. Current wages. climate. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it's nothing. It was yeah. nothing like that. I mean, it was a good wage, mm-hmm. but it was nothing like that. So mm-hmm. I would have had to have, in fact, when I made it at Celtic, it wasn't good enough. And I would have had to have then found a job outside of football at whatever time my full time career was, uh, it came to an end and I didn't need to. Yeah. I didn't need to transition yeah, yeah. out of full time and into mm-hmm. uh, work. I, yeah. I was I was working from the age of 20 uh, at a fairly decent level and very quickly I was earning enough money from my day job mm-hmm. and quite a nice part time football yeah. wage as well that, you know, it was, it was very quickly. Uh, the the balance was that I think when I was, went first went to Queen of the South in 1994, I was 24. Mm-hmm. Um, Hibs were interested in Billy McLaren, my manager at, at um, Queen of the South, mentioned it to me. But I, I wouldn't have given up my career by that point. I wouldn't yeah. have given up my day job. Yeah, because I was between, mm-hmm. and obviously the fragility of yeah. football as well. You know. Yeah. You know, it might be that you've got a two-year contract, but then that two-year contract back then, you might be, you know, the scrap people mm-hmm. again. And did you, when you got to the stage of playing kind of part-time and you're working alongside it, how was that combination? Because obviously it's a full-time job is hard enough on its own, but when you then get football and it's not just a case of you're playing on a Saturday, it's still a commitment that runs alongside that, but how did you manage the two? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I managed I managed them on the basis that um, I, I effectively trained full time. I, I would do mm-hmm. my own training as well as training with the, the clubs that I was with. Yeah. I was training probably five times a week, four or five times a week. Right. So, as I as I said earlier, you know everything played kind of second fiddle. Mm-hmm. My career in sales, the first job I got, I was very fortunate because my managing director and and my mentor in terms of what I've achieved or what I've got to do through my, my working life. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a big football fan. Right. And I remember my interview with him at the time. I was, uh, I think it was Albion Rovers. And I had to do a presentation to him and two or three others mm-hmm. in this boardroom about why I should work for this company. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was always fairly cheeky with bits and pieces. But I played on it a bit. Right. And uh, I said, yeah, well, can I work under pressure? Have you played for... Albion Rovers, <laughs> you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, he was just, he took to me. Right. And there was a bit of come and go in terms of, I was doing my numbers in terms of sales mm-hmm. and he would let me get away and go to my training or right. go and do whatever I needed to do with the football. Yeah. So because he was a football fan, it worked. It mm-hmm. worked. In other instances, the very first interview I had for a job was with a recruitment consultancy. And the lady who interviewed me uh, said, listen, we really like you. However, because of the amount of time and money that we would need to invest in you to train you, we would ask you to confirm that you wouldn't go full time at football. Right. And I said, no, I couldn't commit to that at this stage. So uh, that job never came about. Mm -hmm. But I was very fortunate because I then worked for somebody who was a football fan. Yeah. And does that... I'd imagine, obviously, and you, you touched on it earlier on with the support you got from your family and your wife as well. How much of a difference does that make when you've got a supportive like boss, you've got a family network that's supporting you in what you want to do, and you're managing to kind of combine those two, and you're living a dream, basically. Because you play I, football at any level, you're you're living a dream of most kids. I and and listen, that was imperative that yeah. I, I had that, and I, I still to this day I see young footballers who go into a part time environment and and they can't actually cope with it because Mm -hmm. they've got to you know that they've got to then find a revenue stream which is a day job yeah and uh, they don't always get that support from Mm -hmm. employers or it just might be that you know the actual time that they have to spend in their employment just doesn't allow them to 
devote as much time mm-hmm. to the football. So I, it was, I, I, I've been fortunate that yeah. I had a, a couple of key things that happened for me, and certainly the the gentleman Reg McAtee who, who I worked for, um, he was classically, you know, trained sales, mm-hmm. you know, FMCG, um, very much a. a real rigid sales process right. that is available to anybody that could sell anything you know yeah. it was it wasn't just the product we were selling you could have taken that and then moved it into some other field and mm-hmm. it would have still worked the sales yeah. process would have worked there so i was fortunate from that perspective mm-hmm. and in the sense of when you're in that that part-time bubble did you was there a kind of trigger point for you where your aspirations moved to I'm just going to stick with the part time, and even if something comes along, I'm no, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move to like a full time club. Or what? What was the kind of point for you? We were like, this is a career for me, and that's that's how it's going to it pan was, out. It was, it was probably, probably in the back of my my first daughter being born when I was twenty three. Right. So I was twenty three. I was in a day job that I was unlimited commission structure. Mm-hmm. So the harder I worked at that, the better I got. Paid. Yeah. So, and as I said earlier, the the interest from Hibs came about because we played them in a pre season. Sorry, pl- played them in a, an early season League Cup game, mm-hmm. and I did well against. I think it was my sure Pat Lining and somebody else, and I showed up well in the game. And uh, Hibs had asked about me after the game, and Bill McLaren spoke to me. But by that point, I'd already decided that I wasn't going to give up my career outside of football mm-hmm. to. You know, throw it all at the football side. Yes, yeah. I had a mortgage. I was a, a young, yeah, you know, daughter, um, and I actually enjoyed the the balance of the part time, full time yeah. thing because it was a release away from the job, as mm-hmm. opposed to it be, I never ever looked at football as being a job. Yeah, I was paid yeah. for it, but I would I would have done it for nothing. Mm-hmm. There was plenty of people would say yeah. that was probably like a vocation. Aye, I, yeah. I would have done it for yeah. nothing. I, I would honestly, but I was very very fortunate that. You know, I, I managed to 16 years playing the game and uh, loved every minute of it. Did we win very much in the teams that I played with? No, really. <laughs> but I Still loved enjoyed it. it. I loved Aye. it. Every, every single minute of it. And did you, obviously being in the the part-time environment, you, you said it yourself, some players can struggle with that. Some players that are at full-time clubs now and they maybe go to a part-time club and loan, it can be a culture shock. For for younger kind of youth players etc. Moving for you growing up, how did you find it in the sense that you're obviously working in a sales environment, which is a pretty tough industry on its own? But did that make it easier for you in dressing rooms etc. And obviously you'd have your older heads in there, you'd have old school managers in there. Did you find the balance easier because of your own experience in working life? I I, th- I think it, it kind of rounded me as yeah. a, as, as a kind of person that I wasn't just. You know, working within a football bubble because mm-hmm. I, I do, I know, and I, I still know guys mm-hmm. who their entire working life was spent inside a full time dressing room. Yeah. So actually trying to, it's almost a wee bit like Brooks and the Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. You know, they're, you know, they're yeah. kind of, it was the word institutionalized yeah. and, and it's difficult for them to come out of that bubble of mm-hmm. the dressing room. I, I was going into the dressing room for a laugh and a mm-hmm. joke and it was serious work, yeah. but I, the, the, characters that I played alongside, the guys that I played alongside, they were in a similar situation. They were mm-hmm. all doing okay in their, their day job. But it meant something to us. You know, yeah. we were extremely proud yeah. of what it what it was to be a professional footballer. Mm-hmm. Did everybody devote themselves the way they should have done? Probably not, but they then fell away to the side, you know, yeah. and somebody else would come through. Mm-hmm. But it's a great point you make about the kind of grounding of young professionals. Yeah. So now I know Craig Levine, a good friend of mine, Craig used to send players out from Dundee United to mm-hmm. Hearts, you know, out to Cowden Beef or yeah. wherever it would be. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, Gary Kenneth was one that he, he sent out from Dundee United and it kind of made a huge difference to yeah. him because he actually then appreciated what he had at Tannadice as yeah. opposed to, you know, sometimes when you're just in that one environment, it can be, mm-hmm. you know, it's, oh, here we go again, yeah. rather than actually appreciating what you've got and that's not, to get Gary, Gary Kent at all, mm-hmm. or any player like that. But I think until you experience the other side of it, yeah, you you, you can forget what you've got. And I, 
I'd imagine for your point of view as well, you you must have seen it firsthand with, with young kids coming into a team that are running part time for kids that you might have kids watching this that are playing football. Would you recommend that if they had a loan option to move to a part time club? Do you think they would get a benefit out of having I, that step and going to see what what it's actually like for people? Yeah, I think I think it would be good for most young professionals. Mm-hmm particularly the bigger clubs yeah we are and again the, the 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 environment that the young professionals are now working within and the practices that they are involved in and i don't mean the football practice i mm-hmm. mean in terms of the whole um experience of being a professional footballer yeah i mean at 17 18 19 you, you were a nobody at the bigger clubs yeah whereas now there are you know young kids that Rightly or wrongly, they think they've arrived and they think they're part of this big thing. Yeah. I mean, when I was I was Stennis Muir manager for a period of time, right at the start of the pro youth stuff, and the under 18s coach came to me, I was the first team manager, and said, Listen, we've got the chance of signing uh, a really talented young boy. I says, All right, what's, what's his background? He says, mm-hmm. Oh, he's been at Celtic Rangers and Hearts. Mm-hmm. I says, What do you mean he's been at Celtic Rangers and Hearts? Yeah. He says, Oh, he's, he's been at Celtic Rangers and Hearts. I says, You've not been at any of them. You know, uh, and I wasn't even cruel. I was yeah, just saying because he'd played under 14s at Hearts yeah. and under 15s at Rangers, under this was them suddenly. The, yeah, the coach was telling me, yeah. you know, they, they had been part of the Celtic system or the Rangers. System. Yeah, but that's no making it. Making it's when you're playing in the first team. Mm-hmm. That's that's when you've made it. Yeah, but going back to your point, I think it would be good for plenty of young players to go and see what it's really like at mm-hmm. Coface if you don't apply yourself yeah. because it is the margins are so fine yeah that if if you're looking for an excuse in football you find one Aye. but you can't hide from the mirror you know you need to look mm-hmm. in the mirror and say did you give it everything you've got and if you've given it everything you've got and you've got to the level you've got to then well done but there's a lot of very very good players that for some reason didn't get to the level they should have got to yeah. but ultimately that's down not always not always down to just them but more often than not, it will be, be it will be because they've not either applied themselves properly or listened or mm-hmm. got the wrong advice, and they've probably accelerated that move away from the level they should have got to. Yeah, yeah. That is an interesting topic because I've seen it happen so often with players, and you see them going in loan, and then they they may be going with that attitude of. Well, I should be starting every week here because I, I come from X, Y, and Z. But then you go into another team and you think, well, you're still a small fish in a big pond here because there's pros that are just as good as you are, but they're turning up every week and they're delivering every week. And it's not as easy as just going, I'll go down a division, it'll be fine. No, and, and it'll one work of, out well. One of the big things, and I also have a, a interest in this football agency, so I'm a FIFA licensed agent now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's it's interesting where you know players sometimes drop down a level to go out and loan, but the win bonuses for the level that they're going to mm-hmm. actually means something to the teams yeah. or to the guys that are playing at that team. Mm-hmm. So it's really really important that yeah. you know every day it's we refer to it as grown up football, men's yeah. football type thing, but it's grown up. You know, it's mm-hmm. proper adult football. Yeah, it actually means something. You know, mm-hmm. because how much that person earns in that football pitch is down to whether they win the game or not, you know, yeah. rather than at the top end, mm-hmm. bonuses are bonuses, but yeah. they don't really change the lifestyle of the no. player because they're already getting paid this. Ah, it's not affecting mortgages or bills or anything no. like that. No, it's a wee add-on. It's yeah. a wee, maybe another yeah. couple of weekends in some nice hotel yeah. somewhere, but it's not really determining what lifestyle they've got. Yeah, no, 100%. And from your own playing career, obviously, when you're when you're getting to the kind of point where you're thinking that you're going to then move into just doing either your full time job or something else comes up, did you stop through injury or did you just get to a point and be like, I'm, I've kind of done everything I want to do? What was your thought process moving from playing? Uh, there wasn't a thought right. process as such, Gary. It was a bad injury, right? Um, Back in 2002, pre-season game down at Barrow when mm-hmm. I moved to Stennis Muir, 
John McVeigh was the manager. John had tried to sign me for Partick Thistle uh, the day before he was sacked. So I don't know if he got sacked because <laughs> he tried to sign me. <laughs> but he got sacked the next day. And then the same day that he got sacked, Frank Sinatra died. Frank Sinatra is my hero, one of my heroes. Right. So that wasn't a good day. Um, <laughs> but that's life, as Frank would sing. <laughs> um, but 2002, we played a pre-season game down in Barrow. And after right. four minutes... Um, I was assaulted effectively, a guy right over the top of the ball. I had got to the ball first, I just planted my left leg and he lunged in and I can still see him coming at me. And he went right through me and my leg just shattered basically. So um, I was in the physio's room on a stretcher waiting for the ambulance to arrive. Mm -hmm. And then I heard, <laughs> I heard all these the studs coming down the old fashioned cor uh, corridors, you know. And through the tunnel, and I'm thinking I'd lost track of time, but I was mm -hmm. thinking it must be half time. And three or four of the boys came into the dressing room, they were into the physio room, and, and they were, You all right? And I says, I, what, what's I've no, I said, No, he's pulled us off the pitch. John had taken us off the pitch because after the referee didn't do anything to the guy who had jumped so in, didn't he really send them off? Or didn't he send them off? Didn't he ask for him to leave the pitch? As you can imagine, back in the day when tackles were tackles. Yeah. Some of our guys went for some retribution mm -hmm. and it just ended up a stramash. So John ended mm -hmm. up taking the team off the pitch before somebody else broke their leg. So 2002, um, I was basically, I was down in Barrow and Furness. I was operated on the next day. The, the, that was a Saturday. I was operated on the Monday, actually. Um, and I was down there for the rest of the week, get back to Friday. And very quickly, I was told that it would probably be unlikely that I would be comfortable enough to play again. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a steel rod down through my tibia and my left leg, which basically was holding it together. Mm -hmm. And it was suggested to me by the surgeon that the turning and twisting of playing football wouldn't be something that he would recommend me doing. So that was it. So it was, the decision was made for me. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, that made it a lot easier yeah. because... There wasn't a should I go and do another season? Yeah, because you know because I was capable. Of it. I mm -hmm. was I was fit. I was always fit, but it was uh, taken away from me. So it was very much right. That's finished. Mm -hmm. John McVeigh was brilliant. Dennis Muir were brilliant with me. He wanted me to be involved in coaching the youth players, mm -hmm. um, which I did. Took on board probably you know once I was back up and on my feet. Mm -hmm. Pardon the pun. Um, helped out with the youth team and then when John lost his job the, the board asked myself and one of the other senior players mm -hmm. to take over for a few games the first team and as usually happens they won a couple of games and mm -hmm. we got it to the end of the season and then we got it the next season and then I took it on myself the, the second or third season um, so the, the decision to stop playing football was kind of mm -hmm. taken away from me so it very quickly transitioned into a bit of coaching the BBC asked me to do some work with them which I did um, and then when I went as the f manager of yeah. the first team uh, I stepped back from the, the media stuff mm -hmm. uh, but when I left Stennis Muir I returned to doing mm -hmm. the media stuff so um, I, it was pretty much it was a uh, right that's your career finished on the pitch yeah. well, what are you going to do now so yeah. um, and I think that was easier for me because I would have liked to have been like Andy Mallon and still playing at 40 and 41 yeah. um, because I think I would have been fat enough to do it and, mm -hmm. I, and I was never quite you anyway so I yeah. don't think I could have got any slower <laughs> <laughs> And did you have aspirations to go into management? Like even even coming to the point you were playing, you were obviously getting older. Had you start taking a? Well, I'd already done my badges, Aye. so I had. I think I got my A license. I think I I qualified with my A license in something like nineteen ninety eight. So I think it was twenty eight, seven, twenty eight. Mm -hmm. Went down to Largs and um, did my A license. Or started with the the B license, then did the A intro and A. Um, certificate so yeah I, I, I'd done that in preparation for staying in football mm -hmm. to some degree yeah. but I didn't know what that would look like and I certainly didn't expect to be involved with the media for as long yeah. as I was as well mm -hmm. so um, that came out of the blue and, but I loved that part of it as well yeah what was the what was the transition like from player to manager because you always you see a lot of Thing even now you see a lot of players that they become a kind of coach and then they they're suddenly thrust into that spotlight and I would imagine at any level it still brings its own set of stresses and 
and kind of targets and objectives that you need to make. But how did you find it going from playing and coaching into that I, that hot seat? I well, I, I, there, there's kind of two two elements to it. There's the there was for me the tactical bit of getting the team right and mm -hmm. shaping the team right, but there was also the and I would not, never have called it HR, but but that's what it is now. Yeah. You know, it would be the human resource. It yeah. would be about managing the players and managing mm -hmm. the characters within the dressing room. So there's a football bit, and then mm -hmm. there's the other bit. Yeah. Um. And actually, I was managing sales teams mm -hmm. in my day job, so I was already kind of managing people. Yeah. It's you know, transferable. So, transferable skills. Yeah. I was also I was kind of national training guy director for the business that I worked for at the time so I was all over the UK assessing people about how they were going about their business and mm -hmm. how they were selling and how they were preparing how they were analyzing what they were doing so I tried to introduce that from a football perspective and it was pretty much you know sitting down with the players regularly and, and discussing where they thought they were at this point in time and mm -hmm what else could they do and mm -hmm. you know what more can we get from them? how else, how more can we support them mm -hmm. and this was it was not revolutionary but yeah. it, it was it was a wee bit ahead of the time because did they buy into it did the players buy into it some of them they... did whatever right. the hell some of them right. did some of them didn't they some, yeah. some of them would tell you what they thought you wanted to hear but you could see through that right. but by and large you have to say the, the players I worked with were brilliant mm -hmm. they, they gave me everything and there were a few interesting moments within that Stennis Muir journey that mm -hmm. we, we, we blew it. We should have won the the fourth tier of the third division mm -hmm. uh, as it was at the time um, and absolutely blew it. And there was a lot of backlash about that as to why it happened. And uh, it was not very nice mm -hmm. in terms of some of the things that were getting said uh, about some of the players mm -hmm. and, I, and I backed the players which um, a couple of the people at the club didn't particularly like. Right. Um, but it was it was the right thing to do because the players had given a huge amount during the course of that season. I blamed myself because I had looked at trying to extend contracts probably too early mm -hmm. before it had actually been clinched. But right. I thought with a good group of players, I was, exp I was handing, not handing out, but I was discussing contract mm -hmm. extensions and giving contract extensions to some of the key guys. And they didn't down tools, but the, the hunger dipped, and, yeah. and we get caught in Mexico Park Lane's uh, cow and beef team won the league uh, ahead of us in the final day of the season. So it was it was horrific, and again that was that's a sliding doors moment, you yeah. know, where Stennis Muir had never won the league. Mm -hmm. I still don't think they won the league, um, but you know if you if you delivered the the league championship there, yeah. who knows what might have happened from yeah. a you know, coaching yeah. management career uh -huh. as well. And and actually it was around that time that I was getting involved with my pal in terms of the business that we're now working in. Mm -hmm. And there was discussions around that time if something came up in a full-time manner yep. in the football management side of things, mm -hmm. who would the partnership, the, the shares transfer or whatever it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was something that, you know, I, I kind of, sliding doors moment that it might have went that way but yeah. it didn't it it went that way yeah <laughs> so. see when you, I'm always curious about this when you see teams that are maybe in a they're in a really dominant position and you start to see it kind of a team's pulling them back in and you can see they're in a rut of they're just not picking up points but see within that environment and you're managing those players how hard is that to try and turn around because you're, you can obviously see it week by week you can see other teams catching you do you get to a point where you're like I don't know what else I can do here within that well, dressing room environment the, the, the way that I, I approached that Gary was that the, the players don't become bad players overnight yeah. the players they didn't down tools mm -hmm. they didn't just stop playing but you could actually see physically that they were starting to look over their shoulder yeah because they had been so dominant yeah. and went into the last quarter of the season, nine games, nine points ahead. Mm -hmm. And it was, and it wasn't a foregone conclusion clearly, yeah. but that was what it looked like to the outside. Mm -hmm. And if I was to then start making wholesale changes, because that would almost be a panic for yeah. me. Yeah. So I, I trusted the players mm -hmm. made wee different, slightly different changes, tried to change some of the routines to listen, let's just, we'll have a, 
a, a, a laugh a night yeah. rather than it be trying to de-stress the situation. Mm -hmm. But by and large, you know, it's like everything else when, when the momentum swings mm -hmm. in any sport, yeah. as we've watched in golf or, or American football, baseball, whatever sport it is, if the momentum swings, see, try to yeah. grab that pendulum yeah. and pull it back to your direction, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to do. Yeah. Because as soon as it goes, you know, and I remember watching, you know, Greg Norman capitulating the Masters yeah. with uh, Nick, Nick Faldo, mm -hmm. you know, and it was horrific, but you know, but he was m the best player over yeah. the three, first three rounds. But in football, it's a habit, you know, and a few, a few don't have that, mental resilience more mm -hmm. than anything else mm -hmm. then as soon as that starts slipping it's almost impossible to grab it and yeah. pull it back and it's always a manager that gets the blame aye no matter and, what it's... and listen that's that's what they're paid for i mean yeah. i wasn't i wasn't getting paid in yeah significantly different to the players but that's the buck stops at the manager mm -hmm. that's everybody who goes into management will tell you they understand that yeah and if they don't understand it they shouldn't have been management yeah would you have it's easy to be hypothetical in hindsight but if if that point goes the way you want it to go, would you have seen yourself taking a full time gig if it presented itself at that point? Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. But yeah. it would have been the right situation mm -hmm. and it would have to been very, very considered. I would have had to take time to really think about it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah. It, it was it was definitely something that I thought if it presented itself, then I would consider it. Mm -hmm. But Listen, it was, I was only there two and a half seasons, so it was premature for me to think that way. But you've always liked, you know, that kid that always wanted to be a footballer, yeah. even as a 30-something, but mm -hmm. you want to be a full-time manager. Would yeah. you have maybe gone to a, you know, going from Stennis Muir to a championship mm -hmm. type, you know, full-time gig, and then maybe into the premiership or yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's that's the way it goes. That's mm -hmm. what you think. Because mm -hmm. if if your ambition is that you just want to be the Stennis Muir manager for the rest of your days, then you're doing yourself and the club a disservice. Yeah, yeah. And did you, when you left the club, did you still see yourself as want to be involved in football, yep. or would you just want to Overnight, stick to business finished, at that done. point? Really done. I went to a board meeting on the Monday night. I was flying out to New York on the Thursday, I think it was, to run the marathon the following Sunday, mm -hmm. November. And there was a stink at the club that was just no going away mm -hmm. because of the yeah how the final weeks of the season had uh, played out the previous season. So we started the next season. Um, we still that bit of disgruntlement. The fans were still a wee bit... Well, very disappointed. Mm -hmm. Clearly, understandably, some of the directors were a bit, yeah, probably one or two of them would have liked me to have gone in the yeah. summer. Yeah. Um, Just off your own back rather than them. No, I think they, no, I wasn't, they I wasn't, wasn't, I wasn't for chucking it. I yeah. was rebuilding and I was going to go again. Mm -hmm. And we were about two points off the top of the league. We were second in the league mm -hmm. and I was up at Elgin <laughs> and we were really struggling in a game. I think we finished up drawing the game. But one of the Stennis Muir fans came round in front of the dugout mm -hmm. and he was absolutely, he'd been out Aye. all day. Aye. So he was blittered. And he started shouting. I couldn't understand what he was saying. Aye. He was shouting at me and shouting at me and shouting at me. You know, and, and I just thought, I don't need this. Yeah. I really don't need yeah. this. So I spoke to Craig Levine, I think it was on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. I was the board meeting, regular board meeting on Monday night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to Craig, Craig, I'm, I think I'm going to just say, and he says, Des, I'm telling you right now, you would be stupid to resign mm -hmm. because it's a job that, you know, umpteen people will be desperate to have. Yeah. And my reply to him, and I'll remember it as, well, I'm no desperate to have it. Aye. So I'd made my mind up. Yeah. So I went into the, I went into the boardroom and I asked at the start of the, board meeting can i just ask you know before we get into nuts uh, the nuts and bolts of the meeting uh can you just tell me do you want me to still be the manager here mm -hmm. and two or three of the guys were pretty blunt just says no i'd have you in the summer I was like, thanks for right. that <laughs> you know what i mean what a confidence you need <laughs> and and two or three of them were like absolutely we want you to stay right but as soon as i'd heard what two or three of them were say i just listen right and see when i walked out that night mm -hmm. I, it was as if honestly it was as if a 
an entire suit of armour had just slipped off me. Right. And I went away to New York, man, on the marathon, and it was magic, and I loved it. And I just thought, nah, ever again. And I had some opportunities to get back mm -hmm. involved, and I just I said no. Somebody had asked me not that long afterwards if I would go and help out, and I just said no. I'm sorry, I've, mm -hmm. I've had my time. It was brilliant while it lasted. Yeah, but never again. And did you see yourself at that point having any involvement in football, like even like press or? anything at all or well, would you completely I, switch off? I already had a column a fortnight sorry a weekly column in the mm -hmm. sun by that point um I had I hadn't I had been doing stuff with the BBC prior to getting the job at Stennis Muir I'd been doing some bits and pieces for the BBC mm -hmm. so I didn't anticipate that I would go back into that but mm -hmm. I did uh, the BBC contacted me and I was covering games for them or I was in the studio every Saturday for the results show mm -hmm. Uh, so so that was giving me my kick so mm -hmm. for a period of time it was 2006 7 to 2010 it was purely media mm -hmm. driven and craig at the scotland job he asked me if i would go and do reports on uh, the opposition mm -hmm. so i had to go away and watch spain in spain which was murder oh, no, and, and, <laughs> and give, give, a, <laughs> give a, a report on how many passes did the uh, you know, Busquets miss or how many goals did David Villa score yeah. and, and talk about, you know, the strategy of the team. Mm -hmm. and it was brilliant. I mean, it was a fantastic opportunity to go and experience life at a different level in football. Mm -hmm. uh, and like that, it was, you know, Liechtenstein. It was, it was bounced around Europe, yeah. covering all the games. So that gave me a wee bit of involvement from a actually, you know, meaning something to the performance and analysis side as well as doing the media stuff mm -hmm. uh, but that was that was just I, I treated that as a real special bit that yeah. Craig trusted me and always trusted my opinion on different things so he wanted people close to him that could help with, help him and uh, I was just given that opportunity so um, I was delighted to, to do that for a mm -hmm. short period of time, a couple of years um, and then it was back out again yeah and do, just to the media stuff so yeah that's um it was never really a, a burning ambition to get back involved directly in whether it was scouting or analysis mm -hmm. or management or mm -hmm. somebody asked me a number of years ago if i would fancy going and doing the uh, sporting director course right. at manchester university but it wasn't something that i yeah. really I, I didn't particularly want to get involved at that level again where mm -hmm. you were you know, employed by a club yeah. that you were then, you know, involved full time. Was it tough for you, see, being involved in the Scotland setup, obviously, and, and, and your, your friends with Craig, was it tough for you? Because you obviously got a hard time with the press and things like that as well. And you've obviously been in the managerial position and it doesn't matter what level you've, you've done it at, most managers will relate to each other at some point for an experience or something they went through. But... How did you feel sitting on that other side watching him go through that kind it's of horrible. dog's abuse from the it's press? Horrible. And, and it's, it's, um, it's the way, it's the way football is now, yeah. you know, and, and listen, that was 2010, 11, 12. Uh, that was, it was prevalent then, but mm -hmm. it's, it's even more prevalent now, you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. it's so immediate. Everything's got to be from the first minute mm -hmm. everything's got to be landing perfectly for Aye. fans to you know take people on board mm -hmm. and and obviously the big one for craig was his, his formation that he set up against czech republic which yeah. you know turned out it was four six zero yeah which it pretty much was but it was actually meant to be a four two four which mm -hmm. you know and, and people forget the czech republic score for a corner scotland didn't particularly create a huge yeah. amount of game but that was a formation that you know, Spain played most weeks, you know, with a false nine, all that kind of stuff. Oh, Man City done the full last season with no striker. And, like and, and, you know, one of the boys at the Sun where I, where I was doing my, my journalistic stuff, um, he was he was right into me, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd have sacked him before the game. I'd have sacked him before the game. It's a scandal. A scandal that we go out with a striker. I say, that's right. That's fine. So, that listen, we knew it was coming. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. Um, it just kind of rolled on from there. So mm -hmm. that was horrible to watch. Yeah. And, and I've, I've, I, honestly, I have 
sympathy for every manager who goes through it. Mm -hmm. There's not one manager out there that goes in with the intentions of letting the club down, yeah. letting the supporters down. Mm -hmm. There's certain ones that don't help themselves. Yeah. And I have a kind of wee snigger to myself at times when I see that they hurt. Um, but that's because of their arrogance. Yeah. I think there's, you know, Bill McLaren, I mentioned him earlier in an interview or the discussion. Um, he had a great line, you know, what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what he used to say. What yeah. goes around comes around. And if you if you go into it by an arrogant, you think you're better than the level and I'll soon get my points across here and everybody else is wrong, you know, then mm -hmm. there's a hell of a slap coming at some point Aye. to you. And, uh, but most most of the guys that get into management I've got huge sympathy for. Mm -hmm. But you would need to be you would need to be almost a sadomasochist to be involved in management because yeah. you're going to get it. You will get it. Mm -hmm. No matter what happens, you are going to get dogs abuse. Yeah, and it's it's not even, it doesn't even depend on the level because you see managers now that have won everything and they'll go to your club for six months and if they're lucky, six, right six away. months. Yeah, it's, six months is a long, long time. It's, um, I mean, there's players, even, you know, junior managers and, and you know, uh, he's taking us as far as we can go and right. we need to get rid of him. You know, and all you see, social, I don't do a huge amount of social mm -hmm. media now, but I, I, I'm on a couple of the platforms basically to gather information yeah. and, and see what's happening in the news. And uh, I mean, the amount of, you know, and I was actually saying it a guy the day, the amount of times you just see, uh, please don't put, uh, please don't post anything else until you've sacked a manager. Aye. You know, that's just a weekly occurrence Aye. in some of the, you know, Twitter feeds or whatever it might be. So, I, it's, listen, it's a thankless task, but tell Josie Mourinho that when he's sitting with 90 million in payoffs, Aye. right? It's not really that Aye. thankless. He's one of the ones I've got less sympathy for. Aye. But it's for the guys that, you know, and they have sacrificed everything and their family have played second fiddle. They've put everything into it and they've fallen short for whatever reason mm -hmm. and they still get dogs abuse. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you can't win. Exactly. Was it more stressful managing or working in a sales environment? Managing. Really? Oh, yeah. You need to be a social worker. Because <laughs> you were, you then... Yeah. The, the sales environment, the day job... As I, I kind of alluded to earlier, I, I, and this is this is going to sound terrible mm -hmm. and, and corny, and I would use another word, but I'm not going to use it. But I I don't go to work. Yeah. Right. I mean mm -hmm. that sounds <laughs> tragically bad, right? <laughs> but I don't go up in the morning. And go. Off, I'm going to my work. Right. I've got a routine. I get up in the morning. I get up at six o'clock. I'll mm -hmm. go for a, an hour's walk. Mm -hmm. Get my head clear. Get myself ready. Yep. Up and away. I kind of describe myself t at times that. I'm a bit of a freak and I don't mind sharing that. I'll be six o'clock to 11 o'clock just about every day. Mm -hmm. I, I don't stop working. Yeah. When I go on holiday, if people try to phone me, I'll pick up the phone. I don't put out offices on. I'm available to work. Yeah. Right. God love my family. They understand that. Mm -hmm. But just because of the number of different plates I've got spinning, yeah. I need to be contactable in certain mm -hmm. situations. However, I never ever felt, I've never really felt stress at work. Yeah. And that's the business that I'm a, sh a partner in, myself and Adrian McKenna, my business partner, split 50 50, we were told at the time when we did it, off of our own financial advisor and best pal. Mm -hmm. That's all never work. You two will follow it. And that was 22 years ago. So, yeah. It, it's, we've never had a cross word. Mm -hmm. It's never, it just it works because yeah. we're so aligned. But, the, the element of we've went through the biggest banking crisis mm -hmm. and the business has stayed open yep. and, and vibrant and we went through the coronavirus mm -hmm. and we've stayed open and, yeah. and, and vibrant yeah. to what uh, vi vibrant is, mm -hmm. but we've, we've survived yeah. two major, major things. And we're not going to be millionaires, we're not going to be mega rich. Mm -hmm. But we're content and yeah. we love doing what we do. Yeah. We've got a brilliant team within the work, the workplace. We've got a great support mechanism for suppliers. We've got brilliantly loyal clients. Mm -hmm. I would like to think because we see it as a two-way street, we take yeah. care of them, they, they back us. So I love going to my work. Yeah. I really, honestly, sometimes I'm 
was it Sunday already? <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> a beauty. Monday, you know, Monday, you're cracker. That's me. I'm back to work. I'm, I'm kidding, but it's. I don't. I don't. I don't have any issues working. So mm -hmm. football was much more stressful. Yeah, managing the team. Jeez, enjoy. <laughs> right. that, that was proper stress. <laughs> what about? I don't like using the word mistake, but throughout even doesn't it be football it could be your sales career it could be anything what's the kind of biggest learning point you've had the biggest learning point for me would probably be that you would need to well i can allude to it again earlier make sure you don't leave any chance mm -hmm. if there's shortcuts to take don't take them Give it your all. Yeah. And if you don't give it your all, then don't try and blame somebody else yeah. when it doesn't go right. Mm -hmm. That's not really, um, I don't mean this to say, that's no mistake I've made. Mm -hmm. Everything that I've done in my life has been at 100%, you mm -hmm. know. But for me, I think the there's been occasions where I have been too trusting right. of individuals and business people mm -hmm. because I accepted that everybody, <laughs> everybody played by the same rules of ethics mm -hmm. and morality, but they don't, yeah. you know? Uh, so I think the mistake we will have made from a business point of view will be probably to not think twice about trusting people yeah you know but i, th I suppose that that's also a, <laughs> i'm trying to think out loud that's almost a, a, a bit of a strength because i would rather you trusted with everybody yeah and found out that maybe one person let you down rather than yeah. no trust in anybody mm -hmm. you know so but, but business is tough yeah business is tough but we, the the main point is and i've seen not not so much in your business now but back in the day when i was first working in the environment a lot of people looking for shortcuts yeah and a lot of people complaining they weren't getting paid enough but it was because mm -hmm. they weren't actually doing the hard yards mm -hmm. and it's similar to football yeah you know if you if you do the work mm -hmm. then you'll generally find your level yeah and not everybody can be a you know nuclear scientist not everybody can be a doctor mm -hmm. not every but that doesn't matter right. you just give it your all whatever your vocation or whatever work you do just give it everything you've got mm. and, and take pride in what you do yeah and if everybody was to do that i think with a you know a, a very vibrant economy and the city that glass ones you know and i think you you said it yourself earlier and we'd, we'd spoke about it i think with business as well people probably don't realize how tough it is to run a business because you do have a, a demographic now who will try and run a business and if it's not making masses of money after a, a year or so they just stop there, there's no real kind of we need to stick with this for a four or five year journey we need to see how it pans out there's that overnight expectation now but from your point of view is that ever going to be a realistic expectation for having a business to get rich quick yeah no no because if it was that easy everybody be able to do it and mm -hmm. not everybody can do it and i mm -hmm. don't mean that to put people off mm -hmm. by all means give it a go some people fall into it some people have got a real talent for you know whether it's entrepreneurial or whether it's creative or whatever it is they've got a knack for it and they can do it um but don't be afraid to be somebody that works in a really good business and mm -hmm. just be a really good employee yeah you know, it's, I don't, I, again, myself, my business partner, we, we are, we are employees of the business. Mm -hmm. The business fails. We fail. Yeah. You know, so yeah. we're part of a team. We're part mm -hmm. of a team. We don't actually refer to everybody's colleagues. Mm -hmm. I actually, a number of years ago, was introduced in a meeting. I, I, was, I just popped my head in to say hello to somebody and, and the person in, from our organization said, oh, that's, that's my boss. And afterwards, I said to him, I said, don't ever refer, please don't ever refer to me as your boss. Mm -hmm. I'm one of your colleagues. Aye. And that's the kind of, how we try to, the, the kind of dynamic and the culture that we've got in the business, mm -hmm. that we're all in it. Yeah. So uh, I think there's too much 
emphasis on, and even in football, and this is this is a, a, a football and and business or employment. So one of my frustrations with football now is that football isn't a game for kids to go and just enjoy themselves. Yeah, football is now about a career path. Mm -hmm. For the vast majority, yeah. it's a career path because the kids at five, six, seven, and eight, rather than just going playing football, they're always that we thought in the mind of the mum, dad, uncle, auntie, whoever it is, mm -hmm. coach, further on up with the kid, you know, I can be a professional footballer. Now, I dreamt about being a professional footballer. That's okay, it's all right to yeah. dream. But the expectation isn't from a lot of the parents yeah. back then. That man, mum and dad never came to watch me play. Yeah. Now you've got cars running every pitch. You've got bodies everywhere. Now, yeah. that's fine. But I think there's a pressure on kids now to perform, mm -hmm. to get a career path in football. Yeah. Not everybody, and, and this goes back again, to, not everybody's equipped to be, to have the right mentality, to be a doctor, to be an accountant, to be, you know, somebody working on a building site. I couldn't work on a building site. Yeah. So, Good luck to you. See if you, that's your calling and that's mm -hmm. what you can do. And then brilliant. Yeah. I just I just think that there's almost a a, a generation where it, it's, you've always got to better yourself. And I I, I don't mind that element of mm -hmm. trying to better yourself. But don't forget that there's a lot of good people out there that do a lot of hell of a good jobs. Yeah that we all need to do their job properly mm -hmm. for us to all enjoy what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so I, I think if it was as easy as, you know, the old saying is if it was that easy, everybody would be doing it, yeah. you know? So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of startups that just come and go. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, there's different businesses now, you know, that, and listen, if, if people can make ends meet and enjoy doing what they're doing the way that I enjoy doing what I'm doing and it's, whether it's hairdressers, whether it's tattoo artists, whether it's whatever it is, mm -hmm. then brilliant, good luck to yeah. you. But are you going to get rich doing it? I'm not so sure you're going to yeah. get rich doing it. But that might not be the that might not be the motivation mm -hmm. to be involved. It's Palamine um, has worked in the car industry, he's worked in the print industry. He's at a stage in his life where he's decided, you know what, he went away and trained to be a bike mechanic, cycle mechanic, and he's now he got a shop out in Camp Tallach mm -hmm. and his quality of life's much better because yeah. he's just you know got a wee bike shop and mm -hmm. getting by and no no getting rich yeah but content yeah, and i enough. think that's that's the word that i would yeah. if there's one word that i think everybody should strive for it's, it's content mm -hmm. it's that kind of if you are if you're chasing it for a monetary value it never really stops because you'll get x amount of money then you'll want double that and you, you say to yourself with the football I think most kids and I probably know the kids but most parents look at it as a business now rather than a kid just enjoying a game of football and when I was younger my mum and dad would say anything to stop you wanting to be a football player they'd be like go and get a trade or yeah, yeah. get a job in inland revenue a job for life yeah, yeah. things That's like that right. and now it's counsel. like it's totally different and I always wonder how many of those kids actually want to be there when you see them on the pitch and they don't, like, they don't look happy. No, you know what I mean. They don't. People, the very few players. I, I I'll go to some youth games and there's just a pressure on the kids. If yeah. they're involved in the pro youth system, there's a pressure on the kids, mm -hmm. and I never felt that pressure when I was. Yeah, yeah that was hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. But I never felt any pressure. I was yeah. going to Closeburn Street and Postle and. You know, it was brilliant red yeah. ash. And for the rest of the Saturday night, I was picking bits of red Aye. ash with my, my thighs. You know, or cow layers or whoever it was, mm -hmm. St. Leonard's at Easter House. I just, I just love playing football. Aye. You don't see many players looking as if they're enjoying it when they're no. at under 15, 16, 18, whatever it is. But I think then as well, when you just went and played on a pitch, you could just go and do what you wanted. Whereas now, kids are quite regimented on you shouldn't show off with the boys, you should just pass the ball and move and it kills that kind of maverick of somebody that just wants to go and enjoy theirself. And, Aye, and, and I don't think that type of kid mm -hmm. would be, not say welcome, that's too strong a word, 
but appreciated yeah. in, in the academy system mm -hmm. because the coaches would be trying to get that maverick bit out of them. Yeah. You know, so it, it, listen, it's, it's totally changed. I mean, right. the, the, it, football isn't a sport anymore. Mm. It's not a game. It, no. It's a business, you know, at every level. It's a business. Huge business. Um, more probably not the, the top level of football, but the levels below it. And it's probably a pertinent question given your career journey. See, when you've got guys or girls that are getting to 34, 35, they've done it their whole life, they've maybe not done anything else. What advice would you give to somebody in that position? Based on, you obviously had something else running, but for somebody that's maybe never done that or they're maybe getting to two, three years down the line, looking at it from your perspective, what would you say to people in that position of what they can maybe start to think about to help themselves? I, I think it's too late at that point. Really? Yeah, I think yeah. people need to consider, depending what their their personal situation is. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got different situations. Uh, financially or you know what support they get from parents nowadays um, but if, if, if I look back to when I was involved um, by the time players at that time if they had been getting if I even just now uh, we can we can put it to this era because everybody thinks professional footballers earn fortunes they don't yeah. you know certain professional mm -hmm. footballers at certain clubs earn yeah. fortunes but guys that you know whether it be St Mirren, Livingston, Motherwell, they're earning a decent wage, mm -hmm. but it's not a decent wage that they can retire and no need to work again. Yeah. So I would say that by the time people are coming 25, 26, mm -hmm. they will already know what they are, the likelihood of their top wage is going to be for the next five, six, seven, eight years. Yeah. Some of them might get really lucky and hit it off and get a big move, but it's unlikely mm -hmm. at 26, 27 that you're going to go from whatever it might be at yeah. Kilmarnock or Livingston to mm -hmm. be able to earn enough money in that short period of time yeah. to retire. So I mm -hmm. think you'll I think you need to start thinking about it earlier. Mm -hmm. And I had a conversation with a, a number of different senior pros at clubs mm -hmm. a number of years ago and I actually helped them start to transition out of full time into part time, helped them get a, a job. So th what they were trying to do was they were trying to replace the money they were earning from football. Yeah from a full-time employment but what they did initially was they knew that they wouldn't get in at that level so they went in at x mm -hmm. and the money they earned from a part-time football perspective yep. supplemented that so mm -hmm. they were earning a wee bit more than they were earning previously yeah but as their career came to a close mm -hmm. they'd already built up enough yeah from an experience or from a training mm -hmm. or whatever it would be sales if it's a sales environment you know the bank of clients they've, mm -hmm. they've worked on that that book and they're, they're, they're starting to earn more on it so i think at that period 25 26 27 that's the kind of period where most outfield players mm -hmm. will be at their peak yeah so if they're not earning money at that point that mm -hmm. they can retire on then yeah. they need to start thinking mm -hmm. what they're going to do now that doesn't mean to say that they go to part-time football and get a job yeah they might just need to think about going and doing some educational mm -hmm. stuff or start putting certain steps in, in place to yeah. have businesses outside mm -hmm. whether it's property whatever it is yeah. they, they would just need to think about it then because that period of 27 to 33 mm -hmm. will go by in the blink of an eye yeah and, if, and yeah. if you've not taken care of that bit you're then playing catch up mm -hmm. because your football money drops yeah and you've got nothing coming in yeah you're chasing it at that point yeah do you think more needs to be done to educate footballers on thinking about these options when they when they reach a certain point of their careers i think there's a fair bit of support from the pfa scotland guys i think there's a lot of information out there mm -hmm. i suppose the, the 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 denial from the player is the biggest yeah. issue you know because there will be you know plenty of players out there who know that they're actually going to have to get some but we'll put it off and yeah. i played with guys like that you mm -hmm. know they put it off another year because yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll get to it mm -hmm. that's what i'm saying before you know it it's there yeah so you, i would i would listen i would like to think that people would be advising appropriately mm -hmm. as well to say that listen now's your time to start thinking about yeah. you know what you're going to do when your playing career comes mm -hmm. to an end mm -hmm. after you're at 27 28 that kind of age group yeah uh, what have you got in place what, what are you thinking what would you like to do mm -hmm. and then facilitate 
whatever those wishes are to try and help the individual start on that journey to yeah. you know life after football yeah. it might be coaching badges it might yeah you know it could be something like that mm -hmm. because they want to stay involved in the game and listen there's a lot of really good people in football playing the game i mean um james MacArthur's just retired and you know james not not you know a fantastic career an absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant career but he's he's probably just taking some time to think about what he's going to do next now yeah. james without being too presumptuous will have done very well mm -hmm. from his career because he's played at such a good level but i'm sure he'll want to do something yeah. you know and it'll you know not everybody's in that situation mm -hmm. but even the guys who don't need to do it from a financial point of view will want to do something yeah. to keep themselves involved to something oh yeah i totally agree did you both on football side and kind of your, your day-to-day -day job did you have any kind of mentors or people that you went to when you were not saying necessarily struggling but just for kind of bits of advice or, or points of your career where you just needed that wee boost or a wee pep talk i'm going to sound really conceited here right gary i didn't i didn't ever and one of my closest friends asked me if he could phone me a couple of months ago and he asked me um have you ever had any self-doubt mm -hmm. and he was kind of struggling with his business life yeah. and he just wasn't quite sure whether he could deliver what he was being asked to deliver mm -hmm. and i said quite boldly that i've never really had any self-doubt i've always kind of trusted and been confident in my abilities to do what i would need to do mm -hmm. i've also been and i think this is the the beauty of been involved in football or any kind of fitness mm -hmm. i've got my fitness is a, it's a catharsis I, I i lose myself it's, yeah it's an escape yeah so if i've got any thoughts in my mind or struggles or stresses i try to work it out myself right that said i mentioned earlier that i was very very fortunate in my business life mm -hmm. to work for reg mcatee who was who was my mentor mm -hmm. as a as a salesman and yeah. as a, somebody who could go and run a business mm -hmm. uh, from a footballing perspective i've been fortunate i've worked for some brilliant people mm -hmm. Billy mclaren i've mentioned on a number of occasions already if i bump into billy or if i if we chat on the phone it's like a throwback to the back in the 90s yeah. and all that chat craig levine's been a really good uh, person to have for discussion points mm -hmm. i've got <clears throat> friends in the press bill like a pal of mine will chat through different football stuff um, so I, i've always had sounding boards mm -hmm. but between myself and adrian and, and the, our businesses mm -hmm. we, we kind of as i said earlier we're so aligned that occasionally you know he'll think of doing it a different way and that'll balance off my concerns are doing it my way yeah. and vice versa yeah. so it works really well mm -hmm. um but there is a there is a need for people in football to have somebody to go to there's yeah. no doubt about that mm -hmm. um back in the day it would have been going chat to the captain or going chat to one of the senior pros and mm -hmm. i was later on in my life I, when i eventually did sign for partick thistle it was the same season that john McVeigh had tried to send me before he gets out you know but Thistle were skint. That was mm -hmm. why I was getting signed, uh, quite literally, because <laughs> they were go they were going they were going with a kind of part time older guard, right? And some talented young players mm -hmm. like um, Alan Archibald, who mm -hmm. ended up the manager there. Robert Dunn, Alan Morgan, unfortunately a bad injury, but there was Martin Lachlan, a group of kids who were coming through. Kenny Arthur, who's a goalkeeping coach here just now, but they were young players who yeah. were full time, and we were older wiser mm -hmm. journeyman yeah that would help the kids and balance off and met the budget mm -hmm. so i would have back then tried to mentor some of the young yeah. players and again just wee stupid things back in the day danny lennon joined in joined in and, and he took it on to another level i would always prior to training i would get up the stairs and do setups and press ups and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff and you would then kind of kid the kids on yeah right monarch let's see press ups right. and just try to get them into good habits yeah so people did that with me mm -hmm. i tried to do that with them yeah and in business again you know i had reg to go to or myself and agent of mm -hmm. but 
there's always stuff to learn and yeah. it's just interesting to hear other people talking about their challenges in business mm -hmm. and how they take them on or how they yeah. fix them or how they've tried to fix them but no fix them mm -hmm. so it's, you're always learning you yeah know? that's what i was going to say in that in those situations do you ever is there ever any wee nuggets you take as kind of really good advice or do you do you always try and take the learning from any of these interactions that, that you are speaking to people who are in business as well they're facing into the same problems but they might look at it a different way from you is it always a kind of learning point in I, that on, sense without a doubt there's absolutely and one, one of the one of the issues within our business is the asset value of our business is mm -hmm. is compromised because we don't work with contracts with clients right so a good friend of mine who's been hugely successful floated his business uh, which is now a, a billion pound organization value um you know he said to me a number of years ago the first thing that you need to try and do is get your clients on to contracts mm -hmm. and when i spoke to a couple of the financial directors that i deal with they said to me he says des you're the only supplier we've got that we don't have a contract with right so that conversation came up recently with somebody else. I never did anything with it. Mm -hmm. It was actually just pre-COVID. Yeah. So nothing happened. But it came up again recently with someone else that, again, was just chatting away about various different business challenges. And I mentioned that that's probably our biggest challenge in terms of if you wish to get the asset value of your business. Mm -hmm. But again, <laughs> myself and Aidan, both early 50s, no, seriously, honestly, I'm just early 50s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honestly, uh, we, we don't see it as a an immediate thing because we, we're not, not in any rush yeah. to stop working. Mm -hmm. But if we were doing the right thing by ourselves, we probably would look at that. Mm -hmm. So every conversation that yeah. you have, there's something to pick out of it. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be in the most random circumstances. Yeah, Somebody says something, you think, no, I actually thought about that. Aye. That's a brilliant thing. You know, or you might say something and somebody questions you on it and even just by having the discussion, mm -hmm. it's like the old Roger's theory of, you know, counselling, you know, you actually have the answers yourself. Yeah. It's just yeah. about getting those answers out by mm -hmm. somebody questioning and asking you the questions. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I am in, whether it's you're talking to professional advisors or, or clients or suppliers, yeah. there's always something that you can learn from their processes yeah. or, or their culture, you mm -hmm. know, make sure that you're doing the right thing by your staff at all levels. Mm -hmm. So no, every, every day is a school day. Agreed. And, and above all that, you touched on it earlier, you're a, a licensed agent as oh, well, as if you don't have enough magic, huh? going on. How is, um, how do you find that? Because that's obviously a, but if you if you ask a hundred managers to describe an agent in football, you'll get all manner of responses. But from playing, obviously, you've managed, you've been in the press side of things, you've been in quite a lot of the kind of aspects of the footballing world. How does the agent side compare now that you've actually so, is this sat, a family in those, show? <laughs> sat in any of those shoes? How how do you feel that the difference sits? It's well, listen, see, going back to your point about, you know, if you ask all the managers, they'll say this, that, and the next thing. I think in any walk of life, there will be good doctors. Mm -hmm. There'll be doctors that some people don't really take to. There'll be doctors that potentially could be negligent. There yeah. could be doctors that are dealing with struggles within their own life that compromises how well they're looking after their, their patients. Uh, same with lawyers, accountants, mm -hmm. whatever. Agents are the same. Yeah. You know, I, I, if I knew back then what I knew now, would I still be involved or would I got involved? I'm not sure I would have. Right. That's me being totally honest. Mm -hmm. And the biggest disappointment for me in the agency world side of things is the lack of loyalty yeah. in football. Yeah. So agents get that as well because mm -hmm. um, clients will leave in strange circumstances because yeah. either they've been uh, approached or promised some somewhere else mm -hmm. or or they will think that you're not doing enough for them yeah. when my opinion in that is there are listen there, there is a there is a 
duty of care from the agent to make sure they're looking after their client mm -hmm. properly. Yeah. But there can be a disconnect, which means you're never going to be able to look after the client because mm -hmm. if the client suddenly thinks that they should be going to Man United, yeah. then with all due respect, you're maybe sending them to Air United. Mm -hmm. Then that disconnect's never getting fixed. Yeah. And actually, in the circumstances that it's happened, it's probably been driven by parents. Yeah. So footballs know the football that I've been involved in mm -hmm. and football's changed beyond all recognition. It'll never get back to being what it was. I'm not suggesting it should. Yeah. But football is, is an environment that's, it, it really is unique yeah. because some of the practices just wouldn't go on anywhere else. Yeah. Um, that said, why am I here? with two days of the transfer window to go. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, it's, I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I've made a lot of good contacts. I've, I've committed too much to it for yeah. me to walk away from it. And I'm not suggesting I'm going to walk away from it as the last thing I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some brilliant clients. Mm -hmm. the, the business has got some yeah. tremendous clients, some really talented young players, players that we have that won't, make big money out of football but yeah. whether they're making big money or small money i want to try and support them as best i can yeah because i actually just i just want to see people do well in mm -hmm. football and in life and i think part of the part of the frustration is that there are probably actually too many players in the first instance mm -hmm. every player's got an agent yeah. Not every player needs an agent. Yeah. Not every player needs an agent. Every player's got an agent. Every player under 16, 17, 18, the big clubs love agents. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure that that's right. Yeah. But it's part of the the world that we're involved in. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a strange dynamic. Yeah. But it's also very rewarding when you can see a young player that you've helped suddenly make his debut yeah. against or for Celtic mm -hmm. Rangers or whoever it might be you know mm -hmm. um so there's there's um there's plenty of positives yeah there's a few negatives mm -hmm. but the positives certainly outweigh the negatives or I wouldn't be doing it yeah do you feel your experience outside of football helps as well because you do see a lot of agents and they'll they'll come in with all these promises for for kids and everything is based around a, a football environment but you've been in a working life as well as being in football so you've got both sides of that coin but do you think that's transferable into dealing with your, your clients as well? I well I think I, without a doubt I think mm -hmm. I think it's got to be beneficial and and again part of the part of the process that we would you know recruiting players is about making sure that they're aligned to what we can provide for them mm -hmm. so only recently we, we, we've picked up a client who's left his agent and the first thing that I asked him is what are you expecting us to do? Mm -hmm. Because if you're expecting us to suddenly do X, Y and Z, yeah. that ain't happening. Mm -hmm. So, but the young man was very honest and absolutely knows that he's at a, cri a critical point in his career that mm -hmm. he needs to basically reset and go again, which was really good to hear it's a tough conversation as well it is a tough conversation but to be fair he was, he was terrific um, and very honest as I said if he'd said no 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 it's his fault or it's their fault or it's nothing to do with me I've just been unlucky mm -hmm. I'm not so sure whether they're taking him on right because that's searching for an excuse whereas he'd said he explained where he was but he understood where he was yeah. and we we don't just snap up any player because we think we can make some money off them. Mm -hmm. They've got to be the right type of individual that we know. As I said earlier, if if you pick up players who fully expect to go to that level and mm -hmm. you know that they're not going anywhere near it, yeah, then you're going to spend more time taking phone calls of grief mm -hmm. rather than phone phone calls of thanks. Right. And you don't get a lot of phone calls, I think. <laughs> anyway, say. you don't. And yeah. listen, I'm not asking people to thank me. <clears throat> I'm I'm uh, remunerated accordingly, mm -hmm. but yeah. I'm I'm not asking people to thank me. But it's it's, it's actually really nice. I've got mm -hmm. a set of brothers, two brothers, and I hope he's hope their dad doesn't hear this. But their dad will occasionally just phone me and say, "Listen, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing for the boys," mm -hmm. and that means more to me than anything. Yeah. 
because you're appreciated, yeah. you know. There mm-hmm. have been other ones that just didn't appreciate what you did, and yeah, we've had play, we've had parents pay legal fees to get out of our contract, which I'm just like, how how bad was it, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. And the player didn't then kick on at a level that he obviously thought he should have done. Yeah. So I don't know if he's still with the next agent or whether he's moved mm-hmm. on again. But there's a there's a football's changed so yeah. the mentality within football's changed but what i would say is that the, the business we have we have a, a niche number of clients mm-hmm. who will do anything for we'll try and make sure that we we give them every opportunity to make the most of their careers but what they do in the pitch is what counts michael yeah. jordan said you know everything that he earned off of the court mm-hmm. came about because of what he did yeah. on the court yeah End of story. Yeah. Everything that he earned came about because of what he did on the court. Yeah. And that's the same in football. Whether you're Ronaldo, yeah. Messi, or Andy, I sure you're you might have a super agent, but the super agent is not a super agent unless you're super on the pitch. No, and the super agent can't help you on the pitch. You've got to go out and you've got to do it. Perform you know yourself. I mean? So it's it's an interesting dynamic, the agency world. Yeah. It has to be. I have to, to be honest. And listen, the new FIFA regulations, um, the exam really tough mm-hmm. much tougher than a lot of people expected it to be uh managed to pass it thankfully um a number of people who didn't i'm hoping that they get through uh in the september sitting mm-hmm. some good guys some really good people that just for whatever reason everybody would get 20 different questions yeah. so it wasn't yeah, yeah. ever the same paper yeah. They might have just been really unlucky, so I'm hoping that they get through because there's some some guys who've been involved in the business a long time, mm. good knowledge, good practice, and fundamentally good people. Yeah. That you know it would be a real shame if they weren't yeah. operating mm-hmm. uh, as an agent. So we'll wait and see what happens in that. But I it's taken up quite a bit of time. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously during transfer windows, yeah. but also even outside of that, you know, just making sure the players are okay, going and watching yeah. the games chatting to the boys making sure that you know everything's going okay mm-hmm. so it takes up a bit more time than people probably expect it to yeah it's, it is literally another full-time job you know yeah i've got to say you could get a second book folk <laughs> 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 are obsessed with it uh, no i know and listen there's a there's a fundamentally a a, a misnomer about agents all being crooks and it's all about this yeah. and it's all about that there's as I said, started off, you, you've got good workers in every trade, you know, profession. You've got some that don't go with the the, the most um, ethical means. Mm-hmm. There's there's ones that take shortcuts. There's ones that just turn up when all the work's done. Yeah, you know, it's the same in agency work. Yeah, yeah, it's no different. Mm-hmm. So is <laughs> practically a full time gig with the agency full-time gig with a business and you also do and I, I tip my hat to you an incredible amount of charity work into the the bargain like you've not got enough spare time to be sleeps overrated to, to, yeah to be doing sleeps other overrated. things what um has that always been important for you or have you go, did you reach a point where it just became a real thing you used to want to do all the time no it, it came about gary it was it was when i broke my leg Mm-hmm. So 2002, I mentioned my wee pal Bill Leckie, who's been a great friend over so many years. And I only knew Bill through uh, him being journalist in the mm-hmm. football world um, and got friendly with him. Yeah. Um, I actually approached him in 2000. Uh, so I'd known him for a few years by that point, but 2000, we were both in Florida at the same time, I think. Mm-hmm. And I approached him, I had an idea for writing a book. Yep. And it came about because when I was down at large doing one of my courses, Alex Smith, the great Alex Smith, mentioned, I was talking one night and and he said something to me. And I said, oh, no, Alex, I mean, blah, blah, blah. He said, did you think of some of the managers you've worked for under? So mm-hmm. he started to rhyme off some of the guys I'd worked under and, um, he says, there's a book in you. Mm-hmm. That's what he, also I said, there's a book in you. And I thought, what do you mean? He said, I'm telling you right now, there's a book in you. Now, yeah. Alex was not suggesting yeah. that I go and write a book. Yeah. But, but I had me thinking, if there was a book in me, what would it be? So I had an idea to, and it was really to highlight 
part-time footballers mm-hmm. because everybody thought, you know, the part-time footballers, whether it was at Almain Rovers or Dumbarton or whatever it was, you know, they were they were, they were just they were not really they were playing at it. Aye. And not everybody was as devoted as me, but there were loads who mm. it was they were on it. Right? Yeah. So I, I decided to write this diary of a year in the life of a part-time footballer so mm-hmm. people understood. Yeah. Not really. It was all, almost a wee bit of a catharsis thing for me. And it's there for this entire season, half of it at Partick Thistle, half of it, half of it coming to the South as it transpires. Didn't know that when we went into the season. but mm-hmm. um, And it kind of shows the... And Jack Ross, <laughs> when uh, we were working on BBC one day, Jack had come into the studio, I was already there, and he said, by the way, Des Grace, he says, I read your book every year when I'm on holiday. I was like, that. is that right? He says, aye. He says, aye, it's fascinating to see what, you know, the, as a part-time yeah. player. Anyway, so I'd asked Bill Lecky, right. can we meet in Florida? I've got an idea, I want to float by. So I went for dinner, uh, and I suggested, I'm going to try and write this book, would you mm-hmm. help me? So, I'll get to the point eventually, right? <laughs> so the charity work. So, so Bill and I get really close. Mm-hmm. Um, I would clatter away and send him my, my 9,000 words and he would, as he referred to, a wee bit of spant polish, he'd bring it down to 6,000. <laughs> right. Take out the ums and the as. Right? Write it as you see it. Don't write it because you think it sounds good that mm-hmm. way. Write it the way you would see it. So gradually, you know, Bill had less input to it, but mm-hmm. he would always cast his eye over it. Anyway, Fast forward to 2002, broken leg. Bill was turning 40 in 2003, and he tells me that he signed up to do the New York City Marathon. Well, I says, wow, brilliant, me, mm-hmm. man. Turning 40, and I'm doing it for my Mallon cancer. Right. Relief, as it was at the time. Mm-hmm. All right, why was that? His father um, had been cared for by the McMillan right. nurses prior mm-hmm. to his passing, Arthur, Arthur Lecky. Um, Prior to his passing, the McMillan nurses looked after him. Fantastic. So Bill wanted to give something back. Mm-hmm. Purely selfishly, I yeah. says, by the way, do you think I could do that? Mm-hmm. He says, I know worries. I'm sure we'd be able to get you a place. So sure enough, I did it as a goal to get fit. Right. So this was in the November time. The next November, November the 3rd or 2nd, second, second, November 3rd, I think it was, 2003, mm-hmm. was the New York City Marathon. So Bill and I started fundraise and we had ideas about going to all the clubs and mm-hmm. all the referees gave us an appearance fee. Hearts gave us a full appearance fee for the full squad. Right. Old firm captains were Paul Lambert and Barry Ferguson. And the two of the guys got whip rounds in st- mm-hmm. uh, each of the, the right. dressing rooms, all that kind of stuff. And we raised a fortune. Right. But the biggest thing that came out of it was the unbelievable comments about how much McMillan had mm-hmm. helped so many different yeah. people that had then said to me, Des, my mum or whatever, mm-hmm. and McMillan were brilliant. So there was a sudden kind of connection for me, not having anybody that had ever been cared for by McMillan, but I thought, you know what, that, that sounds like some charity. So yeah. we did New York, we came back, I decided I'd go back the next year again, um, and I, there was two of us went in 2003, mm-hmm. six of us went in 2004, 10 of us went in 2005 and it just started to yeah. build. Now, what happened was we decided we kind of keep going to the same people and asking for money. Mm-hmm. So what we'll start doing is events. Right. So we started to do a golf day. We'll just do our 16th golf day mm-hmm. on Friday past Aye. there and um, raise some money. Sportsman's dinner. My wife has a couple of ladies' lunches. My wife and her friends do the West Highland Way, Rob Roy Way over four days and, mm-hmm. and take groups of people in, and they just raise... raise fortunes yeah. for, for McMillan but the bottom line is that it's twofold McMillan benefit from mm-hmm. it hugely yeah. and we've now we're just about to get through the £2 million mark wow. since 2003 uh, but to give you some perspective on that we went through the 1000 mark in 2017 so the next million has come about much quicker because yeah. the team has just grown exponentially so what actually happens is the, the, the real benefit, McMillan clearly mm-hmm. are the yeah. benefactors of the fundraising, but the individuals who sign up to do the challenges that we put on, yeah. we've had people running marathons that would never have believed they could yeah. run a marathon. Yeah. We've got people going up and doing Ben Nevis. We've got people doing the Rob Roy Way or the West Highland Way. We've had people, we're, we're 
I'm going out to the Italian Alps in a fortnight. There's 13 of us going over to do some of the biggest climbs in the Italian Alps right. on the bike cycle. So we've had people cycling, running, walking. We've, we've Kilimanjaro last October. Wow. There was 15 of us went over, 13 summited and raised about 90 grand on the way. So it's become a real movement. Yeah. It's not even, it's not even now just a, a wee thing. Yeah. It's, it's a real movement and like everything else, in my life and in my wife's life, you know, when we commit to it, we've committed yeah, to it, in. you know, so there's a massive support mechanism. We've got a nucleus of maybe 15 real key, key people, mm -hmm. 20, 20 real key people, like some unbelievable sponsors yeah. and helpers. But each year we just try and keep on building it. Yeah. And Macmillan, Macmillan have, they've asked us to speak at, conferences they've asked us to attend various different things mm -hmm. um and they see us as as being a very unique yeah fun it's almost like a fundraising team for yeah. them but it's a voluntary fundraising team yeah and we'll i think it's 150 to 180 grand a year through our mm -hmm. you know team that yeah. we'll, we'll give to mcmillan and we tend to always ask that it's spent west central scotland yep so the new Beatson entrance uh, at Annie's Land um, at the Beatson Cancer Centre, mm -hmm. it's supported by Macmillan. So we we kind of funded that yeah. with their money. Yeah. We spend money, or we, we give them the money that we're giving them at the moment goes to the telephone service that, yeah. you know, for people and families living with cancer that they can phone yeah. in. So, so you so, can see where it's going as well. Aye, we, can can we can actually tell people that's mm -hmm. where our money goes so yeah. it's it's been brilliant and mm -hmm. it's been brilliant for a number of things uh, my brother sadly passed away 2017 he was cared for mcmillan as well so that's my only real direct yeah uh, involvement with the charity from a personal perspective but the amount of people that talk to me on a weekly daily almost a daily basis about mcmillan and their mm -hmm. experiences of working with mcmillan and the yeah. support they got from mcmillan it's just listen there are a million charities out there yeah. that are all deserving and uh, glasgow we've got some incredible beats and i mentioned you've got the prince and prince of wales hospice you've got so many worthwhile charities but mcmillan's the one that i've kind of landed on it mm -hmm. and therefore we've landed on it but every year we see and it gets underlined to us why mm -hmm. we need to do more because yeah cancer was when i first started i think one in five it's now one in two yeah so it's not going anywhere fast no. so that kind of dictates that we need to do more so yeah. and it's a big part of you know my social life as well mm -hmm. it sounds really sad but a lot of my best pals are people that have bought into that yeah. movement as well and, yeah. and I've, I've met some brilliant people through it mm -hmm. what's the biggest challenge you've done like personally uh, probably kilimanjaro yeah kilimanjaro was it was a challenge in every single aspect yeah you know from it was it was very dry so mm -hmm. it was dusty and you were bogging i mean yeah. bogging and it's not as if there's a there's a shower anywhere. yeah yeah you've got to just water, you know I mean? yeah. and it's you're crawling into your tent so you're bogging again mm -hmm. and you're crawling out your tent yeah. so people think oh this tent's the tent's about the size of this desk you know what i mean so you're mm -hmm. you're having to crawl so you can retain heat yeah so you're crawling into it so kilimanjaro physically was probably the was probably the toughest one because at stellar point is before you get to the actual peak mm -hmm. or the summit you're operating at probably 50 percent of oxygen that you've got at yeah sea level yeah so i was i was almost hallucinating I was, I didn't know if I was sleeping or walking. I honestly mean that. It was, it was almost like, am I awake? Am I sleeping? It was strange for about half an hour. And there was medication you could take. I, I decided not to take it. I didn't want to take it. Mm -hmm. At that point, I would have taken it. <laughs> it was too late. <laughs> it, was, it was horrific. And I got to this stellar point where the, the guides who were incredible gave us a wee mug of tea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, my wife was sitting on my knee mm -hmm. and I just, I, I poured all the tea over because I fell asleep. I mean, it was literally, I was, I was just wanting to sleep. But once you, by that point, you knew you were getting there. Yeah. So, but it was, it was, it was a, it was a challenge that yeah. it wasn't necessarily the physical element. It mm -hmm. was the, the dirt. It was the, f the food was brilliant, but 
it was the film the emotions the as well, isn't it? Emotions it's, as well, right. you know. So, so Kilimanjaro was magnificent, and actually, the the the, the real payoff was the local guides were just yeah. out of this world. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazing, absolutely yeah. amazing. I mean, carrying three of our bags all mm -hmm. wrapped up in tarpaulin on their heads and on their shoulders. I mean, just incredible. So, and if you say that's the kind of that's the people you would never have met, never have met unless no. you were doing it. We're actually going to bring one of the guys. So the the lead guy Julio uh, runs up and down Kilimanjaro in a race in ten and a bit hours. Right, we did it in five six days. So he reckons he'll be able to do the London Marathon at about two thirty, which is proper running. Wow. So I'm bringing him, hopefully bringing him over next year right. to run as part of our team at London right. Marathon. We do London Marathon every yeah. year. So hopefully, and we would have never met him if we never went. So there, was, wow. and there was dozens of brilliant, yeah. brilliant individuals. And the difference, and this is some of the takeaways you get, every one of them living in what we would probably look at as abject poverty. Yeah. What a smile on their face every day. Yeah. What a smile Yeah, they're loving what they do. Love it. And they... They know that you need to be a porter first before mm -hmm. you become a guide. Before you know to work your way up. Yeah. And there's a there's a code of conduct for each of the different levels. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a kind of throwback to yeah. how I remember kind of life yeah. being way back in the day. Yeah. You know? So anyway, but I some of the takeaways are from these events mm -hmm. just sensational. Amazing, amazing. I'll I'll finish up with a question. I ask quite a lot of people. Who, who have our own business or have been in that environment for a long time obviously where you are now based on what you know now what would you go back and say to a 16 year old is based on the life you've you've lived all the different kind of jobs you've done the football career you've had the different aspects of things you've been into is there any kind of one thing you would take from that and go back to your kind of school leaving self and, and say something to him? It would it would probably be don't don't go to you know fifty percent, seventy five percent or eighty percent. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, give it a hundred percent. Yeah. If you give it a hundred percent, you'll give it every chance of succeeding. Mm -hmm. And nothing's outside the realms of possibility for anybody. Yeah. You know, if you told me at sixteen or seventeen or eighteen when I was leaving school, sixteen, seventeen, that I would end up, you know, having the experiences that I've experienced had in my lifetime mm -hmm. from a footballing point of view the charity stuff the media stuff the foot i would not i mean, never yeah. believed you you know yeah. I mean, it, it, so nothing's impossible mm -hmm. to achieve but you need to do the work yeah and again that's you know it's the mantra that i would give to any footballer or business person mm -hmm. if you can look in the mirror and say you know what i did everything i possibly could to get to where i've got yeah then well done yeah. no everybody can be a messy no mm -hmm. everybody can be you know a, a bezos or whoever it might yeah. be you know in business yeah but there's a place for there is a place for everybody mm -hmm. but give it your lot mm -hmm. amazing thank you so much this no worries. hope you've hope, hope that was there enough for you no I hope nobody's fallen asleep yet brilliant <laughs> super thank you so much no brilliant